Universal Studios, who in 1983 gave screenwriter John Hughes a three-picture deal after the success of National Lampoon's Vacation and Mr. Mom, both of which he wrote. But this new deal would include Hughes as a director because he had grown frustrated having very little input in the direction in which those films went. So for his next projects, he wanted total control. Now, that first movie of his would be 16 Candles, none of which was shot down at Universal. No exteriors, no interiors. The entire movie was shot on location in various Chicago suburbs, and you guessed it, I recently went and visited them and tracked them down. Hello, from Evanston, Illinois, home of the Baker House, where the Central family and John Hughes' 16 Candles lived. This was the first film he directed. He actually wrote The Breakfast Club first, but before Universal Studios would allow him to make a movie that had five kids trapped in a library for the entire movie, they wanted him to direct another one of his scripts first, about a girl whose entire family forgets her 16th birthday amongst the chaos of her older sister's upcoming wedding. Now, the story goes that while Hughes was writing the script, he had the casting department send over headshots, and he was struck by Ali Sheedy's and Robin Wright's, but it was actually Molly Ringwald's photo that he taped above his desk, creating the role of Samantha Baker with her in mind. The house is the first thing you see in the movie, and it pops up a few more times. And for those of you that like the details, it was built in 1931, has six bedrooms and six bathrooms, 3,200 square feet, and recently sold for just over a million dollars. Back to Molly Ringwald. She was born in 1968 in Roseville, California, to a chef mother and a jazz pianist father who happened to be blind. And when she was six, she recorded an album with him in his band, the Bob Ringwald Fulton Street Jazz Band. And the acting bug hit early. She played Annie on stage in an LA production, but her big break came at 10. After appearing in a couple episodes of Different Strokes, she was cast in its spin-off, The Facts of Life. Who is going to represent Eastland at the Interschool Harvest Queen contest? Oh, count me out! Nobody's judging me on my cleavage. <laughs> I guess Molly speaks for everyone. She really only lasted one season, basically was fired and replaced by Nancy McKeon, but this opened the door for Molly to embark on a film career, and get this her first film had her acting opposite i mean you're not even ready for this list john cassavetes jenna rollins raul julia and susan sarandon in paul mazursky's 1982 film the tempest i just saw john travolta now who's john travolta oh daddy give him my kidding. best regard Molly wasn't really a big star when she was cast in 16 Candles. Well, actually, nobody really was. The closest was Justin Henry, who would play Samantha's little brother, Mike. Just a few years prior, Justin, who had zero acting experience, had been plucked by his next-door neighbor casting director to star as Meryl Streep and Dustin Hoffman's son in Kramer vs. Kramer. And not only did the 1979 film win the Oscar for Best Picture, but Justin was nominated for Best Supporting Actor at age eight, becoming the youngest actor in history to be nominated, a record that he actually still holds today. And the winner is Melvin Douglas in Being There. Now, in a really odd coincidence, the actress who played Samantha's soon-to-be-married sister had also just acted opposite Meryl Streep, twice. Blanche Baker was the daughter of Hollywood actress Carol Baker, who, in addition to acting opposite James Dean in Giant, had received a Best Actress nomination for her role in 1956's Baby Doll. Now, following her mom's acting footsteps, Blanche had starred as Lolita in a Broadway production, but that show was protested and picketed for its subject matter and closed after 12 performances. Blanche then starred in the film The Seduction of Joe Tynan with Merrill and Alan Alda, but 
It was her performance opposite Meryl in the TV miniseries Holocaust that actually earned Blanche an Emmy Award for Best Supporting Actress. Rounding out the siblings would be Molly's real-life little sister, Beth Ringwald, playing her little sister in a very tiny but featured role. And for the parents, you got Paul Dooley and Carlin Glenn. Paul is just a fantastic character actor and very recognizable. He had actually been discovered by Mike Nichols and cast in a Broadway production of The Odd Couple. I think it was back in the 60s. And he really only agreed to take this role after John Hughes added to the character, giving him that touching heart-to-heart -heart scene with Sam that honestly is the whole heart of the movie. And Carlin Glenn had won a Tony in 1979 for her Broadway debut in The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. But to me, the most mind-blowing tidbit about her is that she is the mother of Mary Stuart Masterson, just one of the best and most underrated actors, who would go on to star in John Hughes's phenomenal film, Some Kind of Wonderful. Oh, we're not done with the Baker family yet. I haven't even mentioned the best characters, the grandparents. Just be glad I don't run Hollywood. Instead of all of these superhero origin movies, you would have an origin movie about these hilarious characters. All right, you've got Edward Albert, who had been acting on the stage and screen since the 30s, and Billy Bird, who was discovered in an orphanage when she was a child and became a comedian in vaudeville. I mean, they're just hilarious. And Billy, oh my God, she was in a ton of 80s gems, just a ton. And you'll probably recognize her from another John Hughes movie as the mother with a soft spot who gives up her airplane seat to Catherine O'Hara in Home Alone. The other set of grandparents are just as great. Max Showalter was a Broadway veteran having appeared in over 3,000 performances of Hello, Dolly and had been in the Oscar-winning film Elmer Gantry opposite Edward Albert. Sixteen Candles would reunite these two men 23 years later. But my favorite of them, obviously, is Carol Cook. Now, she took an acting workshop taught by Lucille Ball and became her really good friend and protege, even living in her guest house a while. And Carol appeared in Here's Lucy and The Lucy Show. Yes, we've been friends for several years. Both Carol and Paul were students of mine in the Desi Lu workshop that I had a few years ago. Carol was our star, and whatever money they win tonight will go for their little theater. That's to help aspiring actors and actors. I got to see Carol perform in a benefit a while back, and the song, It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp, had just won the Oscar. So she came out on stage saying, you think it's hard out here for a pimp? How the hell do you think it feels to be a whore? <laughs> the entire place went crazy. She was fantastic. She's actually still alive. She's 98 years old. And just a few years ago, outside of Craig's restaurant in LA, TMZ asked her, I guess about a Trump supporter who had brought a Trump flag to a Broadway production of Frozen or something. And Carol said, where's John Wilkes Booth when you need him? And this is so embarrassing. The Secret Service actually paid Carol a visit. But I happened to be at Craig's a couple weeks after that, and she and her husband just waltzed in, totally unfazed, as if nothing had happened. Oh, I love her. Along with all of the other lovely people who appear in front of this house in the movie is one of the film's most memorable characters, Long Duck Dong, who passes out drunk right here on the front lawn where the family finds him on their way to the wedding. Getty Watanabe was born in Utah and eventually moved to San Francisco where he earned money as a street performer. 
He eventually got cast on Broadway, and when he auditioned for Sixteen Candles, he used an accent inspired by a Korean friend of his, pretending not to understand English, and when the audition was over, he thanked everyone using perfect English, revealing that it had all been a shtick, and he got the part. Now, his character is definitely the most controversial aspect to this, let's be honest. Terribly outdated and extremely politically incorrect film. I mean, there's been a ton of criticism regarding Long Duck Dong. Think pieces, articles, vlogs, all that. And It's all obviously very valid. I mean, his portrayal offends quite a lot of people, and I definitely see everything that's wrong with how John Hughes wrote this character, but I also see the coolest character in the movie. I mean, he's been in America for such a short time, and in a matter of hours manages to get what Sam tries the entire movie to do, basically get laid. I mean, getting invited to the coolest party, meeting someone great. He's cool as shit, and... He just laughs in the face of everyone in the movie, not giving a damn about any of them or their ignorance. And on top of that, Getty's comic timing is just perfect. Speaking of utter perfection, another character who pops up in front of the house, actually right here on this street, is, oh, just saying his name is almost too much, Jake Ryan who parks his car, his hot car, his Porsche, right in front of this house, which actually has a bunch of vines on it in the movie. But we're actually going to talk about Jake Ryan and Michael Schofling a little bit later. Universal Pictures brought its movie shoot to the Chicago area looking for realism. And tonight, a real hot dog stand got the Hollywood treatment. The movie location was a northwest side landmark, the Super Dog Drive-In on the northwest side. Owner Maury Berman will lose $2,500 while the movie is being shot tonight, but he'll get it all back in publicity. We just feel that once it hits Seattle, I can hardly think that somebody's going to hop on an airplane and say, I gotta have one of those Super Dogs. Crowds of neighborhood residents jammed the sidewalks to catch a glimpse of the movie in the making which stars 15-year-old Molly Ringwald as an insecure teenage girl in love. Out on Milwaukee Avenue, drivers of vintage cars rode by, hoping to get them into the movie. They didn't realize the story is set in the 1980s, not the 1950s. The scriptwriter, 33-year-old John Hughes, grew up in Chicago's northwest suburbs. 16 Candles is his debut as a director. All my stuff is set here. Everything I've written is set here. And when things get shot and they try to make California look like Chicago, it never works. And this was one that I wouldn't allow that to happen. All in all, the cast and crew will have spent six weeks shooting 16 Candles in Skokie, Highland Park, Glencoe, and Chicago. It won't be coming to a theater near you until sometime next year. From the Northwest Side, Barry Burnson, Channel 5 News. He's right. No way California could look like Chicago. Unfortunately, Old Niles East High School, shown at the very beginning of the film, has been completely demolished, but I did track down the street where the bus drops Sam's best friend Randy off, and I don't really have much to tell you about Leanne Curtis, who played her. She is a really well-trained actress, though, who still works periodically, and I did read that her family goes all the way back to vaudeville. Now, I first saw this movie when I was really young. I mean too young, in fact, and I just always thought she was so cool and that when I got to high school, everyone was going to be like her. Instead, everyone was more like Farmer Ted, or the geek as he's often referred to. Now, Anthony Michael Hall had played Rusty Griswold in Vacation, and John Hughes has said that he specifically wrote the character in mind for him. Now, apparently, Molly Ringwald and Michael as he's known, didn't quite hit it off at first, so Hughes took them out for a day of shopping at record stores where they began bonding over their love of certain music. And Hughes' little trick worked so well that Molly and Michael ended up dating, kind of seriously, in fact. Well, I mean, you know, as serious as two 15-year-olds can be, but they dated throughout the entire shooting. 
and on weekends, since they were both underage and couldn't join the rest of the cast and crew out at the bars, they would crash bat and bar mitzvahs that were being held at the hotel in Skokie where they were staying. And their romance ended before they filmed The Breakfast Club, but actually remained good enough friends that it didn't get in the way of their professionalism on the set of that movie, and they both still seem to be really good friends today. The dance scene is a huge part of the movie. The interiors for it, well, in fact, all of the 16 Candles interior scenes were shot inside the New Trier High School in Winnetka. A lot of John Hughes movies were filmed on sound stages built in high school gyms. Even the interiors of the house, like Sam's bedroom, were shot there. But there's actually one scene within the dance scene that was shot here at Meadowbrook Elementary in Northbrook. Wow, I planned on telling you all about this scene from the outside. <laughs> I did not expect to get in here at all. A very nice woman, the whole school is closed, but a very nice woman saw me when I told her what I was doing. She let me in and flipped out because she thought she knew everything about where all the John Hughes movies were filmed and freaked when I showed her a photo from this particular scene. I mean, she grew up with all these movies and just couldn't believe it. This is when I wish I had a crew because I could have gotten the whole exchange on film. It was so great. But anyway, it's the scene that stems from probably one of the most memorable lines in the movie. Can I borrow your underpants for 10 minutes? <laughs> when Farmer Ted gets Sam's underwear and shows all of his buddies. I'm not sure why they didn't just build a larger bathroom on the set like they did with everything else, but they didn't. I mean, it just seems crazy that they fit all those little actors in here. You don't understand though. I have seen this movie a million times and cannot believe, I can't believe that I'm in here and I can't believe that it looks the exact same really was an iconic scene, but one that would never get made today. In fact, the whole movie wouldn't get made today, but still pretty wild to be in here. Also pretty creepy. I should go. All right, actually, it makes more sense to me now that they used that bathroom in this school there. Now that I know that it is quite literally just down the street from another house in the movie, in another popular scene with Anthony Michael Hall. Actually, you know, most people think that John Hughes's most frequently used star was Molly Ringwald, but she was in three of his movies, 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Pretty in Pink. Anthony Michael Hall was actually in four, Vacation, 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Weird Science. But John Candy actually has them all beat with eight John Hughes movies. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit more in another tour coming up. But this is the house where the geek's friends live. And he comes to them because they're nerds. And obviously, only nerds in the 80s had cameras. And <laughs> he needs them to take a photo of him and Jake's passed out drunk girlfriend, who he has in a Rolls Royce, to make it look like they hooked up. Because again, it's the 80s and kids did shit like this. And it's just another one of those scenes in the movie that did not age well at all. I've said this before, but I really don't make these videos to talk too much about the actual movies. I'm more interested in the behind the scenes and the making of, and really just love to see the then and now of everything. Like this house, which you also see when the beefy jocks, who look twice the age of everyone else, by the way, drop the nerds off after kicking them out of the cool party at Jake's. John Cusack, of course, is one of the nerds in the Geeks crew, and his sister Joan is also in the movie. You see her on the bus and at the dance. They're actually the only two actors in the movie from the Chicago area, Evanston, in fact. And this is one of their first movies, and Joan just, she steals every scene she's in. I mean, she always steals every scene in every movie. But the strangest thing to me mostly because it's the weirdest cast in Saturday Night Live history, but the 1985-86 season included both Anthony Michael Hall and Joan Cusack. 
as well as Robert Downey Jr. and Randy Quaid. What? Speaking of nerds and geeks, this was interesting to me. Evidently, the tree in front of this house is the tree from where a drunk long duck dong talks to Jake. It's edited to look like it's in front of Jake's house, but it's actually not. It's here. And this is another reason I like the donger. Sam plays coy and hides from Jake, even though she wants him. He sees Jake and he's like, fuck it, I'll just jump on him. Finally, Jake Ryan time. Now, I know the world is completely chaotic and we're all divided, but at least the one thing we can all agree on is how dreamy Jake Ryan is. Actually, I'm gonna walk back this way so I can zoom in. I don't wanna walk up there. Anyway, I don't care if you're a straight man or a lesbian or whatever, you would go to a Jake Ryan house party if invited. And not just because it's a gorgeous 14,000 square foot house with four bedrooms and seven and a half baths built in the gorgeous, again, neighborhood of Highland Park back in 1930. And believe it or not, Vigo Mortensen, who was an unknown at the time, almost got the part. It came down to him and Michael Schofling, who, I mean, was just meant to play the part. But he apparently was almost too shy and too quiet in his audition, but everyone finally agreed that it would only add to his character, and it sure did. Um, he was born in Pennsylvania, but grew up in South Jersey before becoming a model, of course, for GQ. And photographer Bruce Weber actually financed his acting classes in New York City with Lee Strasberg whatever that means. But he went on after this to act in Vision Quest and Mermaids, but in 1991, after he had gotten married to, I think, another model and had kids, completely called it quits and reportedly moved to somewhere like Vermont where he owns his own woodworking and furniture shop, completely disappearing from the public eye. He is, he's an enigma, a, a complete mystery. No sex, no drugs, no wine, no women, no fun, no sin, no you, no wonder it's dark. Everyone around me is a total stranger. Everyone avoids me like a cyclone ranger. Everyone. Alrighty, now if you're a big fan of this movie, your heart may skip a beat when you recognize this place. It serves as the ending of the film that begins with the train wreck wedding of Ginny, Sam's older sister who's hopped up on muscle relaxers and who knows what else. But it's the Glencoe Union Church, founded in 1872 and open to everyone, their website says. And speaking of websites, I was looking up some stats on 16 Candles and still has an 85% on Rotten Tomatoes. And it almost made $24 million in its original box office run, which is not bad for a budget of $6.5 million. And Entertainment Weekly has placed it in its top 50 high school movies of all time list. Right out front here is where Mrs. Baker and her daughters encounter Zelda Rubinstein, who of course was Tangina from Poltergeist, which only came out a few years prior. She has a small role here, perhaps a cameo. And believe it or not, Zelda didn't pursue acting until she was 45. She started studying it at the University of California at Berkeley and booked Poltergeist in the same year, which is just crazy. And this church looks the exact same, except there was a different door on it in the movie. Well, we get another unexpected little treat. I just peeked my head in and there's a whole Sunday service happening. Oh, wouldn't it be amazing if it was a wedding now that I think about it? Um, anyway, there was a gentleman somehow affiliated with the church who I told what I was doing and he said, oh, you have to go upstairs and see where they filmed the bride scene. But I didn't expect to come in here, so I'm not exactly sure what to look for. I remember they tried to sober her up enough to walk down the aisle and it must have been somewhere up here, but... He seemed to know a lot about the making of it and told me that the cast changed up here and some of them used it as a base camp, but I, I kind of recognize this window, maybe, but 
oh, what am I gonna talk about? Cause I didn't think we'd, oh, I know. Okay, so you know who was in the wedding scene? Well, a few people. First of all, John Kapalos is the groom who went on to play uh, Carl the janitor in The Breakfast Club. And he's also in Weird Science. And Bill Murray's brother, Brian Doyle Murray, plays the minister. And this was interesting when I read it. The woman Ginny sits down next to in the church pew is Agnes Belushi, mother of John and Jim, who must have been friends with John Hughes. I don't know, but I just feel like Zella Rubenstein is gonna sneak up on me any minute, <laughs> like she does to Sam in the church. Scary. No, I shouldn't say that. She just has this scary presence after Poltergeist, but actually she was a huge, actually one of the very first AIDS activists, and she even made commercials aimed at gay men promoting safe sex, and later said that it hurt her career, but she didn't care. She had friends who died of AIDS and wanted to help, and she even participated in the very first AIDS Project Los Angeles Walk. Pretty cool. Remember when you used to go out and play with the kids and get sick and I'd tuck you in bed and read you sleep and make you all better? Well, now Mother wants you to be extra careful when you play with your friends because some of them are getting very sick. Their mothers can't make them all better anymore. AIDS. Protect yourself and others. Call 800-922-AIDS for free information and play safely. L.A. cares like a mother. And one more thing. Help me down. It's funny, I wouldn't necessarily classify Sixteen Candles as a romantic comedy per se, but the end that happened right here when Sam sees <laughs> Hot Jake and his car waiting for her across the street, I mean, it is up there with some of the best romantic endings ever. But Sam and Jake, they barely even talk to each other in this movie. Watching it again, I was actually struck by how little scenes they actually have. Yet they're this iconic pop culture duo, and you just root for them so hard. They were actually about seven years apart, and Molly has said that she was really hoping Viggo Mortensen would get the part, but I think she ended up being happy working with Michael. She did say at one point that the most fun that she had ever had making a movie was on 16 Candles. I'm gonna walk through the park across from the church to show you one last spot, but it dawned on me that I said something yesterday while I was filming my Breakfast Club tour that people watching this one might not have heard. I don't know what order I'm gonna post these in yet, but I'm just not a fan of canceling movies because they came out during a certain era. I mean, I totally recognize everything that's wrong with Sixteen Candles. Believe me, I don't love hearing the word faggot said repeatedly. The Asian stereotype, it's horrible, the date rape, all the stuff I've mentioned before. Again, terrible. But racists and homophobes, they exist. They existed then too, and John Hughes didn't invent this. He didn't create it. He just showed you it was happening. And sometimes you have to see these horrible things in movies to make the changes you want to see in the arts. And that's why when I watch these films, I'm just so grateful that we don't see it anymore. And that's thanks to the trailblazers and the people out there making a difference. And you know, John Hughes was a trailblazer in his own right. He invented, well, he reinvented the teen genre. He gave a voice to teenagers that hadn't been heard on film before. Everything up to that had been, you know, parties and sex and booze, and he made these characters human. Okay, anyway, here in the parking lot is where they filmed the conclusion of the Geeks Night Out with Caroline, Jake's ex. And she was played by someone I am low-key obsessed with, Haviland Morris, who was also Wendy in Who's That Girl? She's actually a redhead, but Hughes only wanted one redhead in the movie, so she had to wear a terrible blonde wig. And she's actually a real estate agent now and occasionally pops up in acting gigs here and there. And this isn't her first connection to John Hughes. She ended up playing the mom in Home Alone 3. And, oh, I've seen her on Sex and the City, Law and Order SVU, The Good Wife. Just gorgeous. But that 
is actually it for the locations that still exist today. So I'm gonna close up shop and get to work on the next tour. So please stick around and thank you so much for watching this one.